Good morning, everyone, and uh, thank you so much uh, for finding this topic of interest, and thank you for coming on time. In uh, Toronto, it's sometimes hard to start a program on time, but uh, this is fantastic. Uh, my name is Cynthia Williams. I'm uh, uh, the Osler Chair in Business Law at Osgoode Hall Law School. And uh, this is a project uh, together with Dr. Janice Sarah at the University of British Columbia um, and a project of the um, Commonwealth Climate, Climate and, and Law Initiative. And I'll uh, talk in just a moment about what that is. Uh, but first, I would like to uh, thank a couple of people. Uh, first and foremost, our thanks to the Ivy Foundation uh, for your leadership in this area generally, but also for your funding of this uh, project, uh, both developing the underlying uh, intellectual foundations in Canada, uh, which right now are based in uh, 110 pages of dense legal text that will be uh, emailed to all of you, um, but also um, the, um, the, this panel and uh, a, or this program today and a uh, a, a comparable program in Vancouver. Um, I also have um, particular thanks to three people. Um, and uh, these are people who uh, have helped to put this program together from the beginning um, and have really provided uh, strategic leadership. Uh, one is Gigi Daw from CPA Canada, who's been incredibly generous with her time and help. Uh, the second is Julie Desjardins, who I thought I saw just come in just a second. <laughs> Julie has uh, been amazing from the beginning, um, uh, leading me, uh, pretty much a novice in the downtown Toronto world, uh, to find out who are really the leaders here. And, and we have many of them uh, on the program today, uh, thanks to Julie's help and generosity. Uh, and third, I want to specifically thank Andrea Moffat, uh, because uh, Andrea is uh, not just the program officer for the Ivy Foundation, but she's really been a partner in developing the thinking here and a real strategic uh, leader on this, uh, on this whole topic in Canada. So uh, thank you. And thank you. Now, uh, the, the uh, Climate Change and Liability uh, Initiative is what I call it, but that's not its official name. Uh, the official name is something like the <laughs> Commonwealth Climate and Law Initiative. And it is a project of um, the Ben Caldecott, who we'll be hearing from shortly from the Smith School of the Environment uh, and Enterprise at Oxford University, of the Prince's Accounting for Sustainability in uh, England, which now has a project here in Toronto, uh, of which CPA Canada is a, a leading uh, partner, and of Client Earth, which is an activist uh, law uh, law shop uh, in London. The, the idea of it was developed by Ben Caldecott and Sarah Barker, who we will hear from later. Sarah Barker is uh, a, an attorney uh, with Minter Ellison in Australia. Uh, and the idea of it is that the corporate law and securities law tools have not been used to the extent that they could be used to try to drive changes in business culture. What are the changes that are needed? Well, we need more than 3% of Canadian directors to identify climate change as a potentially disruptive you know, issue for their firms. Uh, Institute for uh, Corporate Directors had uh, a conference in June, uh, and uh, 3% of directors thought climate change was a problem or potentially a problem for their firm. Although 87% think disruptive strategies or disruptive you know, technologies are a problem. Uh, so our, our focus here in Canada is to um, 
to further develop the thinking about directors' obligations to have climate change firmly in mind uh, as they are developing their strategies, as they are as they are surveying the risks for their companies, and as they are thinking about the Canadian commitment to a transition to a low carbon economy. Uh, and the, so that's you know, the first part, is directors and officers' uh, legal obligations. And I should say we are looking at both directors and officers of operating companies, but also trustees of institutional investors. And uh, many people will have noticed that just this week, uh, La Caisse de Depot et Placement de Québec announced that the largest, you know, the public pension fund, in uh, Quebec announced that climate change is going to be considered in every aspect of everything that they do, every investment. Uh, they have said that they are going to put over $8 billion into assets, quote, uh, to, uh, to um, contribute as an investor to the transition towards a low carbon global economy and to seize profitable opportunities. Because climate change is not just a risk, but it's a huge opportunity for forward-looking firms. And uh, to have an investor like La Caisse decide that and understand that and start to be putting climate change front and center in everything that they're doing is an extremely important development. And that is the other part of uh, what we, um, with many other people, and particularly, and institutions, particularly including CPA Canada, that's really what we uh, are trying to drive uh, with this initiative. Now, before I uh, introduce uh, Ben Caldicott, um, I have asked Bruce Lowry, the president of uh, the Ivy Foundation, to say a few words about how this project fits into their strategic initiatives. Thank you, Bruce. Thank you so much, Cynthia, and, uh, and the whole team for a great project. We always get really excited when we know we've funded 100 pages of dense legal text. Um, <coughs> so, <laughs> um, so, uh, so just to uh, sort of put this a little bit into um, context for, uh, for our work, uh, probably four, almost five years ago now, we were um, sort of thinking about what to do after probably almost 20 years of funding primarily forest conservation and um, uh, wilderness protection in Canada. And one of the things that, that uh, conclusions that we came to um, through our, our board deliberations was that the, the challenges we were facing weren't related to any particular issue. It wasn't necessarily about how to deal with sustainability in water or forests or climate or air. <clears throat> that really fundamentally the challenge was the systems that we had in place, the economic systems, the legal systems, um, uh, the you know, business systems and policies in the country that were causing systemic barriers to our ability to move forward on all of these issues. And so we see this as a critical part of one of our three sort of pillars. Um, so the three pillars are uh, uh, sort of policy and pricing, investing and measuring and so our, our thought was that if we do a better job of those three things those are the systems that we can use to um, to try to create leverage in in um, in shifting the economy more broadly to sustainability and that also the other sort of lens for us is the economy and the environment have been um, al always sort of positioned in conflict particularly in Canada um, around um, oil and energy and we recognized a real need to try to figure out how can we better integrate economy and environment in, in decision making and policy. So um, <clears throat> I think this is, this is really interesting, you know, having you know, read the summary report, it's, uh, you know, for the, it's one of the you know, first times I've seen you know, such analysis and such thoughtfulness. And it actually it isn't dense, it's very, very well written. Um, and uh, I, I'm, I'm excited that this is uh, really the beginning of what we're seeing as a big shift in thinking, and um, I was I was the one at that Institute of Corporate Directors <laughs> event, um, and just couldn't understand how, you know, three percent think 
climate change is a problem and 87% think disruption is a problem and how do they not make the connection between climate and disruption. Um, so uh, so I, I just want to thank you all for, um, for the great project working across the countries and uh, I, I think it's super exciting. Well, thank you very much. And I should say... <laughs> Thank you very much, Bruce. And I should say, um, Janice Sarah is uh, hearing what we're saying uh, because uh, this is being webcast and she's uh, listening in. So thank you, Janice. Uh, and if you send us uh, questions, we can see them on this very fancy uh, laptop up here, or iPad. And so I should say to everyone, if you have questions as the panels go along and as the talk goes along, uh, log in and send them. Um, I might need to get an address about exactly where you send them, and they show up uh, here on an iPad uh, for the moderators. Okay. Now, without further ado, it is my great pleasure to introduce uh, Dr. Ben Caldicott, who does look like he's about maybe 22, not 12. We'll give you a 10 more years. <laughs> but is the uh, founding director of the Oxford Sustainable Finance Program at, um, as I said, University of uh, Oxford Smith School of Enterprise and the Environment. Uh, he's also an advisor to uh, the Prince's, the Prince of Charles Accountability for Sustainability Initiative. Uh, he's a special advisor for the Bank of England and a special fellow at Stanford University and uh, is extremely uh, well published in both uh, me mainstream media and uh, specialist journals. Um, the bios for all of our speakers uh, are on in your program, so we're going to try to keep introducing short, but we're really delighted that you could uh, join us here in Canada. Thank you, Ben. Great. Well, thank you for that very kind introduction, Cindy. As you can tell, I've done a lot in my 22 years, um, <laughs> but it's good to be here in Toronto. Um, and I have to say, uh, it's, it's great that it's nice and sunny. We had a rather kind of rainy, gray time in Vancouver, but it was good to be on the West Coast talking to people there as well. Um, so, as you can probably, as you will probably tell, um, I'm not a lawyer, and we're coming to this, I'm coming to this from um, the perspective of uh, understanding the financial and economic impacts of these different liabilities that might arise from misreporting, mismanaging environmental risk, and causing damages, causing climate damages. And so that was kind of our starting point, and why we're collaborating with different organizations to co-create CCLI, um, and that's, that's where we're coming from. I'll say very, very briefly a few words about my program, because I think it's useful to just see how we see this very important work fitting in. We're essentially trying to align the financial system with sustainability, and we think that requires three things to happen. Um, the first of which is making sure that the evidence base around the materiality of the environment to different assets in different sectors and different geographies is better understood. And a lot of that work uh, I'll, I'll tell you a bit more about later, but um, that evidence base is improving all the time. Um, one of the areas where we think there is a lack of evidence, where much more work should be done, is exactly on these issues around litigation and liability, and that's why it's a priority for us. The second thing is around um, data and integrating that evidence into decision making. So you can have great evidence, but if you can't action that in a financial institution with, with, with data and analysis and frameworks, um, you aren't going to change anything. So we spend a lot of time working on those issues now. And again, I'll, I'll show, show you some of the things that we're doing. And then thirdly, um, we know that you, financial institutions, even if they think something is happening, and even if they have the tools to action it, they may not action it because of short-termism, because of governance failures, because of cognitive biases, behavioral biases, culture, policies that are poorly designed, policies that are absent. And so that those sort of barriers we also try and understand um, and overcome in our work. And again, the work that um, we're doing through CCLI and through this project in Canada can help overcome, um, identify and overcome some of those barriers. So just, just a bit of context on what we're trying to do and how this fits. So um, my job this morning is to um, talk to you a bit about the materiality of environmental risk, um, particularly physical and transition risks related to climate change. Obviously, the risks are broader, but we're focusing on climate change-related risks t today um, and how they, can, how, they, how they strand assets and how they can strand assets. 
I'm going to quickly run you through a framework we think is very helpful for understanding um, these risks and the impacts of um, fossil fuel companies and their assets. I'm going to share with you some very initial analysis um, focused on Canada that my, t my team has put together over the, the last few days, um, which sort of shows you w where we're heading and what's possible and how that might um, generate opportunities and risks for different actors in the space. Um, and, and then I'm going to link, try and link, link this back to um, CCLI, particularly how uh, de developments in technology, particularly data capture and data processing, um, might change expectations around transparency and introduce new ways of holding company directors to account. So to start with, um, and this, this might be familiar to, to some people here, but it, it's essentially showing you different risks related to the environment that could strand assets. And assets, um, or stranded assets, are assets that have been prematurely devalued. Um, they can happen for a whole bunch of reasons. They happen all the time. They're part and parcel of creative destruction that we see in our economic systems. The thing that's of interest to us is that the drivers of stranding seem to be changing. So um, the environment and societal responses to the environment seem to be affecting values in significant ways already, and this, this seems to be accelerating. And that's, that's one of the reasons why it's of interest to us. Um, another reason why it's of interest to us is that these things aren't properly priced. Um, Financial institutions, other actors find it very hard to understand and to price these different risks. And that's because they're new um, and the data is not there and they're nonlinear and um, they often require um, interdisciplinary approaches to, to pro uh, properly understand them and act on them. So I have a lot of sympathy for, for institutions trying to understand these risks. It's quite difficult. Um, now, 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 the risks on the slide, it's probably a bit small for people at the back, but essentially it's. Um, regulation and, and, and policy being introduced to tackle climate change or other environmental problems from carbon pricing to emission performance standards. It's changing technology, um, renewable energy technology, battery storage, electric vehicles, and so on, um, the deployment of which is often linked to policy and regulation. Um, changing resource landscapes are also very important. So uh, water scarcity, for example, phosphate availability in agriculture, um, in energy, shale gas and the shale gas revolution has significant implica implications for power markets and energy markets. Um, there's obviously physical environmental change, which I'll talk more about, um, and how that is, is baked into the system already and, and is already having significant impacts in different parts of the world. And then, and then finally, we have social norms, which are, which, are, which are changing all the time for a bunch of different reasons. Um, the fossil fuel divestment campaigns are sort of an example of how these, these, these views in society are evolving and changing and, and how that's also connected to generational change, but also how that's then linked to uh, litigation and liability and how um, judicial systems are in some sense a, a mirror on society. And so as society changes, um, uh, what, what might be successful litigation um, changes as well, and so that relationship is quite quite interesting, and obviously a focus of today. Now, these these different buckets of risk um, are correlated in different ways. I mentioned how uh, policy can affect technology deployment, but also policy is again a reflection of um, changing societal norms, um, and those might change in response to physical climate events as well. So the connections between the, these things are very important, and, and we're trying to understand them. Now, I wanted to just say some words very briefly about, um, about physical versus transition risks. And just to emphasize that um, whichever way you look at it, there is going to be risk in the system already and into the future. Um, and it might be that we have a lot of transition risk and not a lot of physical risk, or we end up having um, a lot of phys physical risk and less transition risk, or in fact, we could end up in a situation where there's a lot of both. Um, and I think it's, it's useful to, to think of it in, in, in this way because um, it's, not, it's not sufficient for um, companies and others to go, well, look, we don't think this transition risk stuff is going gonna, is gonna to happen, so we don't, we don't need to think about climate change because, of course, they're going to be hit by significant physical climate impacts down the line if societies don't respond to, to these issues. Um, and in relation to... Uh, disclosure and the TCFD, which we'll talk about later, and scenarios. Um, one question for us is how we connect uh, these different 
um, pathways of physical and transition risk to scenarios and how, how, and how that can then inform the analysis of companies. Uh, now, I, I just wanted to emphasize how um, exposure, um, asset, asset exposure to environmental risks sort of permeates the system. And obviously it starts at the asset level um, with assets exposed to different risks. Um, you then have companies that are owning exposed assets. You then have asset managers and banks that are investing in or lending to companies. You then have asset owners that are either di invest investing directly, particularly in a Canadian context, or um, more usually allocating capital to asset managers. Um, and then you have policymakers and regulators who are interested in a whole range of different things um, from economic growth to managing systemic risks to microprudential regulation and, of course, increasingly to implementing nationally determined contributions under the Paris Agreement and also the Sustainable Development Goals. But, but it's important that, you, you know, it starts at the asset um, and, and assets are... Uh, you, uh, many of the assets that are exposed to these things are, f are physical assets, they're facilities, they're energy resources, but also um, they don't have to be physical, as physical assets. They can be non-physical assets like IP, human capital, and so on. Okay, so I, uh, moving on to how we, um, we detect these risks and also how we detect the impacts that assets are having locally and globally on the environment, on sustainability. So um, a lot of the work, uh, well, the work has sort of evolved over, over the years, and this is a rough characterization of how it's been evolving over four generations of capability. Um, and it's kind of linked to how stranded assets, particularly um, unburnable carbon and the carbon bubble, those sorts of issues have kind of gained traction. So, so generation one really started in the late 80s and was, t was taking the carbon budget of listed fossil fuel reserves and resources for listed fossil fuel companies and seeing how much of that is compatible with the carbon budget. And there was the first such study came out in 89, a team at UC Berkeley. Um, and then this analysis was replicated in 2010-11 in um, by others, including Carbon Tracker, who you may have heard of. Um, and and, that, and that's, that's useful analysis. It, it, it shows um, you know, the, the scale of the incompatibility between our existing energy system and, uh, and, a, and, a, and a sort of safe climate future. Um, but it has some serious uh, limitations, not least the fact that it's looking at fossil fuel companies listed in usually New York and London and, not, and doesn't look at uh, state-owned resources and reserves, which are very significant. Um, it also looks at the uh, looks upstream, which I, 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 our view is more that you know it's it's the downstream that's going to be impacted first, um, and so and that's the view others share as well. And so the second generation was taking um, specific assets, fossil fuel assets, particularly power stations, and then depreciating those assets, impairing those assets based on carbon budgets. So again, taking a carbon budget approach, but looking um, at specific assets, um, and also doing this for. Um, fossil fuel reserves as well, um, with more asset level information. Um, now, th the third generation, which is kind of where we're at at the moment, um, has, a, has a, a, a kind of broader view of um, the problem. So it's not just about carbon budgets. It's about a whole host of different um, risks related to climate change, but also other environmental risks that I talked about. And it's measuring assets in a whole range of different sectors to those risks and linking that work to um, scenario analysis. Um, now, we produce this kind of research, um, and uh, it, has a, it, it has a number of benefits, but it also suffers from a couple of problems. Um, not least, uh, it's, being, it's being dependent on data sets that are often not very good, or could be better, um, and it's done in a, in a, in a rather slow kind of way, in the sense that you know, you're getting a big big, great report with a bunch of tables in the back. It's kind of pretty low tech. Um, now, the fourth generation uh, that we're, we're heading towards is um, building on that third generation, but really populating it with new sources of data, particularly from satellites and other forms of remote sensing and also big data, and then using machine learning and AI to process a lot of that. So you improve the quality of the data going into the system, um, and that enables uh, some, some cool things that I'll tell you a bit about later.
um, and, and also transforming how that analysis is done so that it can be integrated into the workflow of different financial institutions on demand. So um, basically web portals and doing spatial analysis online, all that kind of, all that kind of stuff. Um, now just a, a tiny bit more on, on the kind of the current paradigm and why it's, um, why it's flawed. Uh, there's a lot of, um, you can probably tell I was, I'm not particularly convinced that carbon budget type analysis for upstream fossil fuel producers is particularly useful. Um, similarly, I don't think that looking at the carbon intensity of companies is particularly useful. So, so the, current, the current approach that people use is they take a company, company A is exposed to all those risks that I mentioned, and then they look at the carbon intensity of the company using rubbish data. And, and that's supposed to give you an answer that allows you to manage risk. It doesn't seem like an appropriate answer to the problems that we face, but that is how it's done. Um, uh, linking back to what I was saying about assets and asset level approaches, we think um, a, a different approach, a, a bottom up approach instead of a top down approach is much more effective. So you, an asset, a company has got a bunch of assets. Um, those assets are exposed to a bunch of risks. And then you measure those things precisely. Um, so if you're interested in physical climate change risks, there are different dimensions to that. You measure them like heat stress or precipitation or flooding or whatever it might be and ditto for regulation and like, exposure to changing technologies and all this sort of stuff. And similarly, you can, um, this, the slide is very focused on understanding the risks assets face, but you can also use this framework to understand it the other way around, which is how are the assets affecting the world um, locally and globally. And that's another dimension of this bottom up framework that is very compelling. Um, so, so this is sort of the, the kind of the, the chain, um, we think, uh, just to bring together the different strands of uh, things that I mentioned. Um, so you're starting at, if you can see, the, the asset, asset level data tied to ownership. You need really good ownership information to do this kind of analysis. You then have measures of current and future risk and impact that I was telling you about. You then need to connect those to different scenarios, and this is important for TCFD implementation and what that looks like in the future. And then the, the final step is, well, once you've done that fundamental analysis, um, what is the company management doing? Does it have a plan? Does it have processes in place? Does it have governance in place to be resilient to these issues? And that's important because you can have a company that's very highly exposed to these risks, but is actually uh, well managed and resilient to, to them. Um, or you might have a company that's exposed to these risks but isn't. Um, so that's another bit of analysis um, that needs to, be, needs to be done. So just in terms of linking um, risks to scenarios, um, again, again, it's all kind of small text, but you're, ta you're taking, you know, how do you measure flood risk um, if you're interested in physical risks? Well, they're different measures of flood risk over different time horizons, and, um, uh, and some, are, some are better than others, and some are higher resolution than others. Um, but, you know, the IPCC has some of that data connected to its climate scenarios, so we can use that measure. And so if you're interested in a 1.5 degree scenario, you use the data set associated with the IPCC RCP 2.6. And if you're interested in a business as usual scenario, for the sake of argument, you would use the, 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 the analysis tied to IPC um, RCP 8.5. Um, and I can bore you with more of this later, but um, that, that's sort of basically the idea, so that you can t take your asset, you've got all these different risks and impacts that the asset's have, having, and then you just you, you, know, you press a switch and you, you run it for, you run the stress test for a, a business as usual scenario, or you, you, you change it to a two degree scenario or a three degree scenario. So we've, um, we've applied that approach to, um, to Canada uh, in the power generation sector and um, the power stations. Uh, this is just a, a relatively superficial analysis and we could do much more. Um, and you aren't gonna be able to see any of these assets on that slide. But th those are all, th all those dots are basically different generation assets in different bits of Canada. God, Canada's big. Um, I didn't realize quite how big it was until flying, flying here yesterday. Um, and and so, so that's just the assets overlaid with a map of Canada. Um, and this is us introducing um, a heat stress overlay. So this is fast taking, taking you to 2035 under RCP, uh, I can't even see it, 
and and how warming changes over that that period. And so you you can sort of see that all a lot of this analysis is spatial. It's taking um, you know knowing knowing where a thing is and then kind of using using an analytical time machine to take it to a future of significant physical risk in this case and, and looking at, at heat stress, which is relevant in the power generation for efficiency and cooling and all this sort of stuff. So it, it's a material physical climate risk to operators of power stations. Here we've looked at um, precipitation. And um, again, this is, this is taking you to 2035 and, how ch and changes in precipitation. And again, that's relevant for water availability and water stress and cooling and things like that. Um, here we've taken British Columbia and we've looked at, and this overlays water stress with two other things. Um, the first of which is um, suitability for CCS retrofit. So um, carbon capture and storage is often used as a sort of, uh, you know, a magic bullet that will solve this problem for, for, for coal-fired generators and fossil generators. Um, but you kind of need to be next to if you, even if you believe that, which I don't, but if, even if you did, um, you kind of need to be close to suitable geological storage. Um, and so we'll, we've, we've taken data sets that look at um, w what might be suitable geological storage and overlaid that. So if you've got a, a coal-fired power station and you're really far away from suitable geological storage, that CCS argument is just not going to hold because no one's going to build a really long pipeline to a single coal-fired power station in the middle of nowhere. Um, and then we've also looked at protected areas here. So, uh, you know, there's a lot of evidence to suggest that projects in or around protected areas are going to suffer from more reputational risk. And again, this sort of gives you a way of, of having a look at, okay, well, company A's portfolio ha is, is actually closer to protected areas on average than company B's portfolio, and that might be a proxy for reputational risk. And we've done this for, this is again the same thing, but for Alberta and Saskatchewan, and then for other provinces in in your vast country, and and then we've and then we've um, looked at the sort of you know we've, we've we've done this analysis for companies in Canada. So again, I I can't see see the names, and but, but you know we've 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 ranked them based on their exposure to flood risk, drought risk, um, precipitation, heat stress, water stress proximity to protected areas, and we could go on. I mean, there, currently we have about 20, 25 different modules, we call them, um, to analyze these risks and, and impacts. Um, now, the other thing that we did using that um, asset level data is to look at um, this idea of carbon lock-in. Um, and this is important. Um, and there's and also a sort of an extension, I think a significant improvement on sort of crude carbon intensity type analysis. Um, and, and crude carbon budget analysis. Um, and you'll see why I might think that in a sec. So, um, so basically, c committed cumulative carbon emissions, um, you know, is a bit of a mouthful. So I'm just going to say carbon lock-in or committed emissions. But essentially, essentially it is um, the cumulative, I'm going to read the definition, the cumulative emissions that can be expected from the future operation of an asset over its expected economic lifetime under standard economic conditions, which is also a bit of a mouthful, but basically is, um, you know, you build a power plant or, or a factory or whatever, and um, if, if it's you're, you, on average, these things last 35 years, and on average, they might be utilized 55% of the time, and you do the numbers and you look at the estimated likely um, emissions over, the, uh, over the, the lifetime of that asset. And that then gives you a way of looking at what our commitments are um, in terms of lock-in, what's, what, what's baked into the system already. And of course, that, that amount can be reduced by stranding assets or changing their, their fuel inputs in the case of power generation um, or, um, or retrofitting them in some, in some way, introducing carbon capture and storage. So there are different ways in which you can reduce committed emissions but it's important to have a sense of what, what, what's baked into the system already. Now, colleagues at Oxford last year published a study that basically said um, th last year um, we had already built a capital stock in power generation to exceed the Paris carbon budget. So if all the power stations in the system already operate as people expect, then we've breached the, the, the budget, um, which is pretty depressing. 
Um, there's another paper that's under review at the moment that I'm a co-author of, um, which revises this analysis, and it actually looks like the year was probably 2012, um, which is even more depressing. Um, now, how does, so how does this relate to Canada and its carbon budgets and, and, and to specific assets? So this is all capacity in Canada in 2016 planned under construction or operating. And we've, we've used that to figure out um, the committed emissions for the Canadian power sector. Um, and, uh, and it's about 2.5 gigatons, I think. And um, as you can see, it's going, it's going down a bit, um, which, is, which is good. Um, and it's going down a bit largely because of um, the closure of, um, of some assets here, which are all coal. So the, the closure of coal is, is resulting in that reduction. But then you have more being baked in, in terms of new, new power stations that are, being, that are being planned or under construction. Now, developed countries basically have to get that committed emissions amount to zero. And we, we need to get to net zero by mid-century. Um, so yes, there's been a decline since 2000, not a massive decline, but a bit of a, bit of a decline in Canada. But of course, this has just been completely overwhelmed in the last decade or more by um, developments in East Asia and Southeast Asia and South Asia, um, which again is a bit depressing. Uh, this is by by fuel. So you can see that coal, coal's at the bottom um, and, and is, was a big chunk and then has, has gone down, but gas has taken on a large portion of the, of the total committed emissions for Canada in the power sector. And, and this sort of analysis is useful, um, I think, to, to, to help foreground you know, the dimensions of these choices that policymakers are, are, are making, right? So it, you might think it's a good idea to replace a 50-year-old coal-fired power station with a brand new clean gas plant um, because it's, there, there, if there are fewer pollutants um, and, it, and it's half as carbon intensive as a coal plant. But um, if you add it up over its lifetime, the total carbon emissions associated with that new gas plant are going to be many multiples the time of the old coal plant that you've just replaced. So it's not, it's not um, we aren't going to solve the problem if we, if we replace coal with more efficient gas. Um, now, what we've done is um, kind of, again, looking at the asset level, is created um, a merit order curve for each power generation asset in Canada based on its committed emissions. So on the, uh, on the vertical, you have um, the inefficiency of the plants. So the least efficient plants in Canada are on your left. Um, and then on the horizontal, you have um, the committed emissions of each, of each plant in Canada. Um, and we've calculated a uh, carbon budget for Canada that is, ca is aligned with two degrees. So not quite Paris, but a two degree scenario. And then we've overlaid it onto this. Now, of course, you can order these things differently. You might go, well, we want to close down older power stations first instead of new ones to reduce the, the, the value of stranded assets. Um, and we want to do that in a way that means that we're compatible with Paris. So you could reorder the chart, but uh, and there are other things you could do too. But this just is illustrative and shows that um, anything in that grey box, so anything from that that grey line, uh, and then to the left, is incompatible with um, with with Paris. Um, and you can do this analysis by company. You can do it by investor. You can, of course, do it by country or region. And this is a useful way of seeing. Um, you know which which assets are incompatible with different carbon budgets. So it's a sort of it's a again a step forward in terms of the types of analysis that we can do now. Um, and and despite being a bit disparaging about taking a carbon-based approach, I think if if you're going to take one, this is this is the way in which you would do it. Okay, so just very very quickly, um, I mentioned um, remote sensing and satellites and big data and all this sort of stuff. Um, and, and basically, you know, costs are falling in terms of megapixels, in terms of storage and megabytes, in terms of processing power, they're going to continue to fall. It's very impressive, as we all know. Um, and the quality of satellite imagery is improving all the time. Again, you probably aren't going to see very much, but, you know, our ability to see um, the characteristics of assets is, is significantly improving. And this means that not only are we close to a, a point where we can see how assets are being used and how use is changing, 
we can, we can also determine the characteristics of the features of the assets, um, but we can also um, potentially uh, monitor emissions of different pollutants from assets using satellite data. Um, and that has very significant implications for a whole bunch of things. Um, MRV in the UN system, you know what the Chinese are doing, we'll know what the Canadians are doing. Um, how you operate emissions trading schemes. You can see what facilities are actually doing. And of course, for disclosure and transparency, um, because you can then see what, what, what companies are actually doing. Um, and uh, you know the satellite launches are accelerating. The, the capabilities are growing exponentially. Um, and our ability to process all this information is also improving, albeit slower um, than our ability to capture the information. So um, you can just, if we're, if we're getting a, a high resolution picture of the earth basically every 24 to 48 hours through all these different satellites which we are um, that's a lot of imagery you've got to process so 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 doing that um, using machine learning and AI is is key to unlocking the potential for all of this and so this is a sort of a simple classifier that one of my postdocs um, created in an afternoon focused on coal coal dumps in the UK so you basically teach the computer to spot what a coal dump or coal pile looks like, and then it finds them, it searches the imagery and looks at them. Um, and we've, we're starting to do this for solar PV as well, so you can see where solar PV is being deployed. This is very important because decentralized renewables deployment is not, not monitored in the same way or, 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 cal or recorded in the same way as large-scale fossil, uh, sorry, power generation. Um, and, and then the other final bit is, is around natural language processing. So, so uh, the computer scanning huge amounts of text in different languages to see um, whether something's happened to an asset or whether ownership has changed. And as I, as I mentioned before, no, you, can, you, can, you, can have, you can have great imagery and you can see what's happening, but if you don't know who owns the asset, it doesn't really help you with the, anal the, the analysis at a company level or an investor level that I was talking about, which is obviously key. Okay, so, that, so that's um, a canter through uh, quite a few things. Um, no, in conclusion, uh, environmental risks are material. They strand assets. That's important. Um, and this is not in dispute. Um, you have assets in Canada. They're at risk from stranding because of these environmental risks. Um, uh, that, that should not be in dispute either. Um, our ability to um, analyze these risks and understand the impacts of assets um, is Im improving very rapidly. Um, and um, and that will enable ultra transparency, um, and that has implications of how society will view these issues and react to them, um, and and that might have implications for um, the topics that you're going to spend the rest of the day talking about. So, um, you know, given that these risks are material, um, so these are sort of some of the implications I think for this agenda, the CCLI agenda, you know. Given that these risks are material and can be measured, there is no excuse for not managing them. Um, you know, the measurement question is, um, you know, is not not a good excuse anymore. Um, second, uh, you know, if you can't if you can't hide, um, you should probably disclose. Um, and um, so, you know, this idea that companies can just not disclose and get away with that information not being available or the right information not being available again will will change rapidly. Um, and it's going to be clear who's, who's contributing to the problem. As I showed you that the committed emissions at an asset level, for example, that's one way of showing who's responsible for, for future warming and future climate impacts. Um, and, and, and that can be used in all sorts of ways by civil society, by politicians, and so on. Um, which again means that you should be trying to reduce um, that impact that you're having because it can be seen. Um, so that's that's it from me. I think there's some time for questions, probably not very much, but thank you. <laughs> At the back. Um, no, we, we, we haven't, but we could. Um, I mean, one of the things, running the data, doing the analysis, uh, and because, because 
it's small, you wouldn't have seen, but we were pondering this yesterday or earlier in the week. So basically a lot of the yellow here it comes up as waste in our waste in our data sets. And essentially I think that's that's gas fired power stations or well, it's heat from gas fired power stations being used for heating, I think. Um and and so you would think that would push gas down this merit order curve. So we, the, so there there are examples of things we need to do more work on. But um, any other questions? Yeah. How did we just seeing amongst the national institutions? Um, what are they doing to grapple with these problems? Um, yeah. So um, so I think there's a there's a there's a definite change in. Um, the sort of person in an institution that's now caring about this. I mean, this is not not necessarily everywhere, but um, over the last two years, it's more. It's definitely much more CEO, CFO, C-suite than it was before. Um, and financial institutions that have been doing stuff on, you know, doing trying to do stuff on this for some time, um, you know, it suddenly stopped being a kind of. It's in the C it's in the CSR or the responsible investment bucket, but is actually crikey, this is touching on every aspect of our business in terms of risk management, portfolio management, client relations, um, public relations, investor relations, that we need a, we need a, we need a serious effort across the company to f and the firm to figure this stuff out. And we're seeing this in, in big, big financial institutions. HSBC has had a massive shakeup within the last two months on this, for example. And so that's all very positive. The reality is, though, that um, financial institutions don't these capabilities are very new, um, and so the stuff that they're doing or, or claiming to do is, I mean, a lot of it's total junk, right? So um, a lot of the press releases, I mean, the, the press release you mentioned to, today, um, what does that actually mean for them? You know, they're integrating climate change into every bit of their business. I, I'd, lo I'd love to see that, and I'm sure there's some serious holes in it. But it, so it's a journey, right? Um, and uh, but it will change quickly because these capabilities are evolving very quickly. Thank you. Okay.